Hi everyone, this is Mike Dowding with the SD Mines Physics Department, and we are continuing our online lecture videos with Chapter 7 material. In the last video, we defined kinetic energy and work. So just to recap, I'm going to put those expressions for kinetic energy and work onto the screen. Our kinetic energy is half the mass of the object times its speed squared. And for work, we have a dot product relationship between our force vector and our displacement. So when we apply a force to our object, and it begins displacing. This dot product has a cosine relationship and that theta value is a measure of the angle between the two vectors. And so if that force vector is uh, pointed in some other direction besides uh, this parallel case, then that cosine theta inside the expression will then tell us how much or how little that force is actually providing work. And then we also saw last time that there was an alternative means to evaluating the work that is done. And that method was to use the x and y components of the force and the displacement um, vectors. And so both, both of these expressions are going to come out to give us the same answer. It really just depends on how the information is presented to you in the problem as to which one you want to use to evaluate your work. And then what we can do is we can realize that at our starting point there's going to be some initial velocity and then when we get to the end of our displacement there's going to be a final velocity which means that our kinetic energy can change. And that kinetic energy is changing as a result of any work that's being done in the system. And that work is going to come from our work expressions. And when we put all of this stuff together, that is when we have the work energy theorem. And it's a pretty simple expression to write out, but as we already know, there's uh, quite a bit of information that's hidden on either side of that expression. So I'm going to take a moment and write this out in its full form. With any delta expression we have final minus initial, but I'm going to write each of those kinetic energy statements using the kinetic energy equation that we had last time. So our final kinetic energy becomes half mass final velocity squared. And the initial is half mass initial velocity squared. And that's equal to the network that is done. And it's this network that we need to focus on um, for most of today's lecture. And this was mentioned uh, last video that in order to find the network we have to add up all the work that is done by all of the forces in the system. So however many forces there are in the system each force is going to be doing some amount of work and we have to add all that up. Now this would be best suited for an example problem. 
So we're just going to jump right into this example problem. Um, for this, I want to consider an overhead view. So we're looking down on this mass as it's sitting on a flat horizontal surface. And I'm going to apply three different forces to this mass. We'll have one pointing uh, page up. I'll go ahead and indicate a reference frame now. I'll have a second force to the right and then we'll have a third force pointing down and to the left. Off to the side here we will provide some magnitudes for these forces. We'll just do 10, 20, and 30. So these are magnitudes of the forces. The directions of the forces, well those are uh, indicated on the diagram. And so force 1 is all in the y direction, force 2 is all in the x direction, and force 3, which I forgot to label, force 3 is going to have components in each direction. And it would help if I had some kind of angle relationship to measure force 3. So I'm going to say that force 3 has this theta 3 value, which is, let's say, 40 degrees as measured from the negative x-axis. So we start here at the negative x-axis and we measure in the positive direction 40 degrees and that gets us to the location of force 3. Now all of these forces, if we wanted to, we could set up a sum of forces which says we're just going to add up all the forces in the system. So force 1, force 2, force 3, and if we did that we would get a net force. But if you're if you've had classes with me, you know that I don't like to do these vector problems all in 2D or 3D. I prefer to break these down into summations in the x and the y directions. So we can look at the sum of just the x components of force, and that would tell me the net x component. We could also look at the sum of components in the y direction. And that would tell us our net component in the y direction. Uh, but this is all chapter 5 and chapter 6 stuff. This is stuff that we should already know. Instead, what we need to do is we need to add up all the work that has been done. And to do that, I need to know which way our mass is moving. And so I'm going to choose to have our mass move a distance d along the positive x direction. Now all this stuff that we just did here Okay, this, this is not worthless. We're going to come back and, and take a look at that in a few minutes. But for right now, I just want to know how much work will each of these three forces do in moving our mass along the displacement vector. And if we need a mass, I'll provide a mass of 5 kilograms, but figuring out the net work will allow us to figure out things like how fast the block is 
speeding up or slowing down. And so we're going to take the work produced by force 1, add it to the work produced by force 3 and force 2. And the work done by force 1, well, if we go back up to the top of the page where we had all of our um, review stuff, right up there at the top, we have our force expression with the dot product, the displacement, and that tells us how much work is done by a force. And that's exactly what we need to do down here with force 1. And we have two ways that we can evaluate the work done by a force. We can either use the magnitude and angle approach, or we can use the components approach. One more thing that I need to include here is what is the magnitude of our displacement, and I will say 15 meters. And that means our best approach for evaluating this is magnitude and angle relationship. And I'm going to call this theta 1 because this will be the angle measured between the displacement vector and force 1. So we go back up to the top. And we see that force 1 has a magnitude of 10. The displacement has a magnitude of 15. So those will go into our expression. And then we need the cosine of the angle between those two vectors. Well, force 1 is pointing up in the y direction. And our displacement vector is pointing to the right in the x direction. Those two vectors are at 90 degrees with respect to each other. And cosine 90 makes 0. So there is no work being done by that first force as our mass is moving to the right. So on to force 2. How much work is force 2 going to do? And again, we have information about magnitudes and angles. We know that the magnitude of force 2 is 20. We know the magnitude of our displacement is 15. And the angle between force 2 and the displacement vector well, they're both pointing to the right along the x-axis. They're parallel, so that means their angle is 0. Cosine of 0 is 1, and so everything here is giving us 300 joules. Positive 300 joules of work. One more to go. How much work is force 3 going to do? And like the other two situations, I know the magnitudes of force and displacement. I know information about the angle. So we're going to put all this information in. 30, 15, cosine of... Now, do be careful, is theta 3 going to be 40 degrees, and, well, 40 degrees is the angle for force 3. In the dot product expression, I need to know what is the angle between the force and the displacement vector. And that's a lot more than 40. Uh, in fact, that's going to be, what, 180 minus 40, 140 degrees. 
and that's the value that needs to go in here. Calculator time. Now you might be thinking at this point, well, he didn't bother finding the uh, x and y components of that third force. And that's because we don't have to. Um, when it comes to forces that do work, it's only the component of force in the direction of the displacement that's actually going to contribute to the work. And it is that angle relationship right here between the two vectors that takes care of all of that information. And so when I evaluate this, what I get is negative 345 joules of work and well is it possible to do negative work so can we have negative work that's a question we'll come back and consider here in a moment but I just want to make sure that everyone is okay with this answer because we said that, you know, there was going to be x and y components of force 3. How do we know that that negative 345 joules is actually the work that was done? Well, we could confirm that by basically just throwing away this y component of force 3 because it's not going to help us do any work in the x direction. It's only the x component of force. And the x component of force 3, let's see, we can have magnitude of force 3 times the angle relationship is cosine of 40 degrees. So we have 30 cosine of 40 degrees, which is, I'm going to round this up to 23. I'm getting 22.98 in my calculator, but that x component of force 3 is 23 newtons in the negative x direction. And if I pair that up, with any work done by that force component along the direction of displacement. I get magnitudes and angle. The magnitude for x component force 3, magnitude is 23. The magnitude of our displacement is still 15. And theta. Well, what's theta between the x component of force 3 and our displacement vector? Well, they're pointing in opposite directions. So that's 180. Cosine of 180 is minus 1. And 23 times 15 comes out to be 345. So exactly what we're supposed to get, because that's what we got down here using the uh, magnitude and angle comparison. So it looks like we're ready. What is the net work being done on this mass? We had 0 plus 300 plus a negative... 345. So altogether, that makes for a negative 45 joules. And that still brings us back to the question, can you have negative work? And the answer is, yes, you can. We need to remember that work, by definition, is the change in energy. 
or an object. So if I were going to change the energy of an object, that would be work. So what would it mean to have a negative quantity of work? Well, that would mean that the change in energy would result in a final energy that was less than the initial energy. In other words, this means that our object is losing energy. And this can happen in two ways. That energy can be transferred to another object, or it can be transformed into another type of energy. So it is possible for work to be positive or negative. Uh, typically, whenever we have a positive work, it means that energy is going into the object. So that object is gaining energy of some kind. Whereas a negative work just means the opposite. It means that the object is losing energy. Well, the only energy that we have discussed so far is kinetic energy. So what does this mean for our block? Up here we had this block with three different forces acting on it, and it seems as if the block is losing energy. So what kind of energy is it losing? Well, I guess it's the only one that we have available to us, which is kinetic energy. So let's throw another piece of information in here. Let's say that our block started with an initial velocity of 2 meters per second. Actually, let's bring that up to 20 meters per second. We know that as work is being done on this block, the kinetic energy of the block will change. We've already done all of the math to tell us how much work is being done as our block moves the 15 meters to the right. So now I want to know, after that movement, how fast is the block moving? And we already know that the block has started with an initial velocity of 20 meters per second. We know that the block has a mass of 5 kilograms. So I'll go ahead and plug those in here. I'll just plug it into this one right here. All right. Well, so what does that mean for the initial kinetic energy? How much kinetic? How much? initial kinetic energy did we start with. And calculator time. I am getting 1,000 joules of kinetic energy is what we started with. Now everything right here, this was the final kinetic energy. And over here we have the amount of work that was done. With a little bit of algebra, we can add that 1,000 joules over to the left-hand side, and that's going to tell us what our final kinetic energy is. 
I'm getting 955 joules. And if that's the case, how fast is that mass still moving? So we will multiply each side by 2 and divide each side by the mass of the object, which was 5. And I'm getting 382 equals the velocity squared, or the final velocity is square root of that, which is coming out to be about 19.5 meters per second. So we, we haven't slowed down all that much, but that's because we haven't lost all that much energy in comparison to what we started with. So let's try something a little different. Let's keep that initial velocity of 20 meters per second which means we will keep the initial kinetic energy of 1,000 joules. But let's ask ourselves how far can this mass move? before coming to a stop. So we're no longer just going to go some displacement of 10. We're going to let this block slide as far as it can until it comes to a stop. And I want to know what that is. Well, if we're going to allow this block to slide so much further than 10, 15 meters, excuse me, 15 meters, if we're going to allow this block to slide so much further, then it makes sense that there should be more work being done by each force as we travel. Now, I really don't want to have to go back and redo all of those work expressions, especially considering that I don't know what the displacement is. But what I do know is that I started with a thousand joules worth of kinetic energy, and if I let this mass just continue moving until it comes to a stop, well, that tells me what my final kinetic energy should be. If I come to a stop, my final velocity is zero, and so my final kinetic energy should be zero. And that means, well, the net work done has to be negative 1,000 joules. And this net work, well, that's the work that's going to be done by all three of those forces over this new displacement. But again, we said, well, I really don't want to have to go back and redo all these work expressions considering I don't know how far I have to travel. But that's okay. Because we are already primed to answer that question. We said that it was possible to find the net force that was acting on this mass. And that net force is going to be made up of x and y components. Oh, sorry, I don't need those technically. And if I can find out what that net force is, I can just apply the net force to the displacement, and that will tell me what the network is. So let's try that. 
uh, when it comes to the x and y components of the forces let's see where should we take this to yep, I think we can come down here sum of forces in the x we needed f1x plus f2x plus f3x and all of that equaled well let's see force one was all in the y direction so force one does not get an x component force two was all in the y direction so all of force two is in um, let me start over. Force 2 was all in the x direction, so all of force 2's magnitude is what we get to use. And then force 3, well, if you remember, we already went through and calculated the value of force 3 when we were double checking our dot product expression. And that came out to be a negative 23. So we don't even have to redo that. We just have a negative 23 for a grand total of negative 3 newtons in the x direction. So how about the sum of forces in the y direction? Well, we're going to add up the components of these forces in the y direction and let's see all of force 1 was in the y direction so that's 10 none of force 2 was in the y direction so that's 0 and then force 3 would have a y component that was let's see y component that was negative based off of that 40 degree angle so f3y would be f3 cosine 40 with a minus sign on it because it's pointing in the negative direction so that is 30 cosine of 40 which is giving me about 20, I'm sorry, this should be sine. This is a sine relationship with the angle. Sorry, I was wondering why I was getting the same outcome as the x component. 30 sine of 40 is 19.3. So we'll bring that down here, 19.3, negative, for a grand total of, what do we have here, negative 9.3 newtons. Okay, so there's the net force. Net force has X and Y components of 3 and 9.3, both in the negative direction. And I need to find the work that's done by that net force as we move along the direction of the displacement. Now our, our net force is presented in component form. And Technically, our displacement is also in component form. Uh, it just has the one component, 15 meters in the x direction. So I'm going to go ahead and use the component method of solving for the evaluation of the dot product. Now, this is the full equation 
that we had earlier. But if you'll notice, there's a lot of things here that we don't have. Or um, maybe I should rephrase that. It's not that we don't have them, but it's that a lot of these values are zero. And we'll, we'll see what I mean here as we start putting values in. So f of x, well, that's negative 3. d of x, that's 15. Plus f of y, negative 9.3 times d of y. Well, our, our d vector doesn't have any y or z components, but that just means that they're zero. And so I can plug those in here, and likewise I have a zero z component for my force, so there's zero coming from that, zero coming from that, and negative 45 for the work that was done. Okay, well, that negative 45 was exactly the same amount of work that we got from adding all the individual works together. And that's a good thing, because if we can get the same answer from two different approaches, then it probably means that we're doing a good job of our physics. But there's a reason why I wanted to show you this particular approach to the problem, because now that we know what our net force is, and we know what the required work is going to be to get our mass to stop moving, well, we can relate that to the dot product evaluation. If we assume that our mass is just going to continue, sorry, that should be an x. If we assume that our mass is just going to continue along the x direction, we can take that information about the net force and use it to solve for the final displacement of the of the mass. So back here at the original picture we said our mass was just going to continue moving along the x direction so really my displacement just has an x component so there is no y component for me to apply so that whole second part is zero all that's left is the x component of my force that was negative three and the missing x component of the displacement so the distance that i would have to travel along that x direction before this mass would come to a halt would be a thousand over three which is three repeating meters so this block would travel about three and a third football fields before all of its kinetic energy was drained away by the work that these forces were doing in combination. Well, that's one really big and involved question involving work done by forces and a change in kinetic energy. But now that we've seen how this all fits together, we can go back and use that same information as a starting point 
for all of our future problems. In all of these physics problems that we're going to be dealing with in this chapter and the next one, there are some, some key values that we're going to be on the lookout for. That is force, displacement, and velocity. Because if we apply a force, MA equals force, over a displacement, that's going to cause a change in velocity. But at the same time, if there's a change in velocity, we should be able to tell how much force is applied over a displacement. And all of this comes back to the work energy theorem. Now, we do have a little bit of time, so let's take these ideas and we'll apply them to a, a simpler expression. Here we have a mass sitting on a flat tabletop, no friction, not yet. We'll bring friction back into the play here in a little bit. But for right now, let's take an applied force of F pulling to the right. Other forces involved would be the weight, and there would be a normal force pointing normal to the surface of contact. If the mass is 10 kilograms and the applied force has magnitude of 25 newtons, what will be the net work done in moving that mass? Um, let's say 7 meters. So what is the network done? And when we get to the end of that 7 meters, how fast are we going? What's our velocity? And we'll go ahead and assume that this block started from rest. So initial velocity 0. Our starting point should be the work energy theorem because, as I said, the things we want to watch out for in these problems are things like force, displacement, velocity. These terms, along with the um, inclusion of mass, really tell us that this is a physics problem that needs work and energy to be solved. And so that's where we're going to start. We're going to take our work energy theorem. And on the left hand side, our final kinetic energy, well that's going to occur right here after we're done traveling versus the initial kinetic energy which is happening back here. And we know that's zero because we started from rest. So zero initial kinetic energy. Well, that means that the change in energy for the system is now just equal to whatever final kinetic energy we have. And that's going to be the result of the network. So how do we get the network? There are two ways that we can do that now. We can go the net force approach with the displacement, or we can take the approach of finding out how much work each force does as we move along the displacement vector. Now this, this top expression might seem easier because there's not as much stuff written down there, but keep in mind 
you are going to have to do some work figuring out what the sum of forces in the system add up to. My preference is just figure out how much work each individual force does and add them all up. So force 1, which was our applied force up here, that was 25 newtons. It's pointing in the positive x direction. Our displacement vector is also pointing in the positive x direction. So the angle relationship between those two vectors is zero. Cosine zero is one. We have magnitudes of 25 and seven for the force and the displacement, which gives us 175 joules worth of work done by force one. So right here we have 175 joules. So how much work is the normal force going to do? Well, normal dot displacement, we would need to know the magnitudes and the displacement and the cosine of the angle between the two. Now, looking back at our picture, hopefully you can do this in your head at this point, but the only motion that we're expecting to occur will be along the x direction. There shouldn't be any um, displacement or acceleration along the y direction. In other words, the sum of forces in the y direction should be zero, which means our normal force should be equal to the weight of the block. But even though we can find that out, the more important part is that our normal force is pointing up and our displacement is pointing to the right. And that's a 90 degree angle, which means all of our work here was for naught because the normal force is not going to do any work in moving the mass to the right. And maybe now you can see what's going to happen with the weight. The work done by gravity is going to be our gravity force dotted with displacement. But yeah, we go through the motions and figuring out what those magnitudes are. But we get right back to another 90 degree relationship. And there's no work done by gravity here. The only work done is by that applied force that we had, which was 175 joules, so nothing, nothing. This means our net work is 175 joules. It is positive, so that means we are putting energy into the object. And ultimately that energy becomes the final kinetic energy of our mass. Now that I know that, and because I know what the mass is, 10 kilograms, I can figure out how fast this mass is going to be moving after it has traveled that 7 meter displacement. So let's see here, we need to multiply both sides by 2, divide each side by the mass, and take a square root, and that will get us the final velocity. We have 2, 175, divided by, what was our mass again, 10? And that's giving me 35 meters per second. Okay. 
Now I think this is a, a good place to stop because these were some pretty involved uh, example problems, but I'll make a follow-up video to this to include a couple of more example problems using um, work energy theorem because keep in mind as we are changing our kinetic energy we are also changing our velocity and that means that there is some acceleration present hence the necessity of using forces in these diagrams but what I want to do in a follow-up problem is see what happens when we already know what the net acceleration of the object is. Um, so I'm going to sort of set this up. We're going to go back to some of those elevator problems where we have tension in the cable, we have weight pulling down, and then we're going to be accelerating upwards as a result of the mass of the sorry, got that incorrect. We're going to be accelerating upwards as a result of some net force in the system acting on the mass of the elevator. And so what I want to know is all these forces acting on the elevator, how much work are they doing on the elevator as it moves up and down, as such, how does the elevator change its kinetic energy, and in turn, how does it change its velocity. So there's, there's a tremendous amount of back and forth that we're going to be doing here when it comes to uh, work and change in energy. And the only, I would say the one real benefit to this is that we're taking information about forces and displacements and we're turning that information into scalar quantities that we can very easily add and manipulate with the algebra. So that is, that is one of the many reasons why we're taking this approach with the physics is to basically give ourselves a break from all of the vector notation. But don't, don't get too complacent because after we're done with these uh, chapters on energy, we will be going back to uh, discussions with vectors when we get to chapter 9 and chapter 10. So chapter chapter 7, chapter 8, these two are going to blend together fairly well. Uh, in fact, I, I might even end up transitioning to the chapter 8 material in the next video as I show a couple of more examples on the, the kinetic energy and the work stuff. So I'll go ahead and end it there. Review as you need to, get to me with any questions, and I'll see you for the next video.